Well, good evening, everybody. Please hear the word of the Lord from Romans chapter 9, verse 30 through chapter 10, verse 17, which says this, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, but the righteousness that is by faith. However, Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though they could by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness... They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes of the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who performs them will live by them. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will go up into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And we'll stop there this evening. I bring this passage to you this evening by way of introduction in Romans chapter 9 and 10 regarding faith and its central position to the Christian uh, experience of salvation. Without faith, we have no righteousness. In this example, Paul is arguing that The Jews did not arrive at righteousness because they were pursuing a righteousness through the law, but rather instead righteousness comes through faith. And so this evening I say all of that because we are going to be launching into another study on the early church father Irenaeus, where Irenaeus is going to be our instructor this evening as he teaches us about the rule of faith and just how critically important it is that we recognize it for our own lives. And uh, I think you're going to be blessed this evening. So with that introduction, let's pray and we'll jump into our discussion. Father, we thank you so much that you have shown us clearly the path of righteousness and salvation. That it is clearly through faith alone in Christ alone according to the grace that you have given us alone, and all of this to your glory alone. And so, Father, this evening as we study Irenaeus, may we learn even further of what your Spirit is saying to the church on the importance of faith. We pray all this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. All right, well, good evening once again. There should have been one handout as you came in this evening, and it is the outline for this evening. We're going to start off this evening by backtracking a little bit, and we're going to just do a quick review of the biography of Irenaeus and reintroduce him. We spent quite a bit of time on this last week. This evening will just be a brief review. And so if you have your biography from last week, uh, you can follow along with that. Uh, we're not going to cover every point. Uh, we're going to skip around a little bit. Um, or you can just watch on the screen behind me. Uh, so let me ask you this question. How many of you need that biography? Maybe you were gone last week and you... So we got a couple here. Alex, you know, just raise your hand and Alex will bring those around to you. That uh, should be the stack there. It says biography on top and then underneath that it says rule of faith. So they'll need both of those. Anybody else need that from last week? Okay, I think we're good, Alex. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's talk about Irenaeus and uh, his life a little bit, as well as an introduction into um, the significance of his life in the church and what it means to us today. So Irenaeus... Um, as with most of these early church fathers, when we're talking about dates of birth and death, they're, you know, it's, it's kind of open-ended because we don't know exact dates, exact times. So we're kind of speculating a little bit. But Irenaeus was most likely born in the mid-140s A.D., probably in or around Smyrna. So, you know, this is roughly yeah, 110 years after Christ. And the region of Smyrna is modern-day Turkey. Uh, you may also remember Smyrna as being important because that was where Polycarp was the bishop. He was the pastor there. So if we look at it on a map, to get our bearings, we have Jerusalem down here in the right-hand corner, Bethlehem, Nazareth. Up here we have uh, Antioch, that most important com uh, Christian community of Antioch. This is where Ignatius was a pastor for a season. Uh, then we have over here, uh, this is modern-day Turkey. We have Ephesus, and right above Ephesus, we have Smyrna. So that kind of maybe gives you a sense of where we're talking there. Also with Irenaeus... Losing my signal. Loading, loading. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> when we consider Irenaeus, we also need to understand that he was living in a very unique time in which he was able to be influenced by some very high profile Christian leaders. And uh, very notable Christians, for example, he was a student of Polycarp as a young man, young boy. Again, we're not sure the dates, but it was most likely for an extended period of time, um, you know, growing up in or around Smyrna. Obviously, the uh, Christian leader in that community was Polycarp, and so he fell under Polycarp's uh, leadership as tutelage for a season. We also understand that he was influenced later on in life by the apologist Justin Martyr while living in Rome. And Justin Martyr is one of those people that we could have added to our list of early church fathers and learned a lot from. But, you know, we, uh, I had to pick and choose in a sense so that we're not doing this for the next 50 years. Um, and so Justin Martyr um, didn't make the cut, not for any reason other than we just had to pick and choose who we're going to put into this study. So maybe we'll study Justin Martyr later on, but Justin Martyr was important in the early church because he was a very influential apologist. Now, an apologist is somebody who makes a defense for the Christian faith to unbelievers, to atheists, pagans, and, uh, and really the focus is from the inside out. Right, So an apologist is most likely working with non-believers, people outside of the church. 
Um, it's a real problem if you're, if you're an apologist and you're trying to convert people in the church, right? I mean, you're trying to defend the faith to Christians, uh, something has gone terribly wrong, right? So, but Justin Martyr, and there's a whole group of apologists that were very influential, very important in the early church. Justin Martyr is probably the most famous of those. And uh, he was in Rome, and uh, so evidently there was a time when Irenaeus uh, left Smyrna and went to Rome, and when he was in Rome, he fell under the, the teaching of Justin Martyr. And as Justin Martyr's name uh, presents itself, he was martyred for his faith. Martyr is not his last name. It just describes uh, the way that he was executed for his faith. Also, um, as we consider Irenaeus, we need to consider him to be a sub-apostolic, third-generation disciple of Jesus Christ. Right? So here's what I mean by that. If we follow a flow chart, we would see that Jesus Christ came, lived, died, resurrected, and ascended to the Father. In that time, he taught the disciples. The disciples are what we also know as the apostles, with maybe a capital A. And uh, so, for example, we have the Apostle John. So Jesus Christ taught the Apostle John, John the Beloved. John the Beloved, we know, taught and discipled Polycarp. And we know that Polycarp discipled Irenaeus. And so there's a succession here of apostolic teaching and, and, uh, and witness to Scripture and to Christ. But also we see here that we can see that Irenaeus is like a third generation disciple. Right? So I don't know if we were to consider, I don't know how, how we would accurately do the math on this, but if we considered ourselves what generation of Christian disciple we are after the apostles, I mean, it'd probably, you know, it'd be in the thousands of thousands. I don't know how many thousands, but, you know, um, anyway. So does, does that make sense, right? So Irenaeus is a third generation disciple. We're probably a 5,000th generation disciple, okay? Just to throw in a number out there. Irenaeus, during the 160s AD, moved to Lyon in southern Gaul, so this is uh, modern-day France, so we find his life beginning in Smyrna, modern-day Turkey. He, uh, at some point in his life, maybe early 20s, he moves to Rome. From Rome, he goes up to uh, modern-day France in the town of Lyon, and then the, the town just south of there, Vienne, and this is where he ministered for the rest of his days. If we see it on a map... So we would see Smyrna would be over here in what is called Asia back then. And at some point in his life, he travels to Roma. you got to roll your R's. And then uh, at some point in time, he moves across the Alps into uh, modern-day France. And probably in this region right in here is where Lyon and Vienne were. Okay. Also with Irenaeus, in Lyon, Irenaeus was a Greek-speaking Christian in a Latin colony of the Roman Empire, surrounded by Celtic barbarians. That's what the Gauls were considered. They were considered Celts, and they were considered barbarians because their language was like the bar, 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 barbarians, right? That's, you know, that's kind of, it's kind of a derogatory term, that whole barbarian thing, but that's you know, they don't speak our language, and so we make fun of what we don't understand. And Anyway, surrounded by Celtic barbarians on the fringes of Roman civilization, and so this is a picture of Irenaeus' ministry. He's, he is not at home, right? He is out of his element, so to speak. He is a Greek-speaking Christian in a Latin colony on the fringes of, Ro of the Roman Empire and Roman civilization, and he is surrounded by Celtic barbarians and pagans. But there was a thriving Christian community here. So all of that kind of keep together there as you consider his experience. Around 174 AD, he was sent by his church to deliver a letter to the church in Rome out of an increasing concern for heresy, right? There's, there's uh, rumors of some strange teaching that is going on in the church in Rome, and, uh, and so the church in Lyon puts together a letter, and they pick Irenaeus to deliver the letter. Irenaeus was probably not the pastor at this time. He was probably an elder in the church, but he was not the pastor. He was not the bishop. And so they sent him 
uh, sometime around 174 to deliver this letter. And an interesting thing, when he arrives in Rome, he makes two very shocking discoveries. The first of which is that the bishop of Rome, Eleutherus, had embraced a heresy by the name of Montanism. Montanism comes from its founder of Montanus, and this was essentially a heresy that centered around a false teaching of the Holy Spirit. It was considered a new prophecy. It was considered a, um, a new supernatural way of experiencing God apart from Scripture. And so the emphasis was on subjective experience of the Spirit with no scriptural support. And uh, a lot can be said about this. Um, it was considered a heresy by the church. And uh, that was his first discovery. The bishop there had embraced this. Second of all, a man by the name of Florinus, who was a friend and also a fellow student of Polycarp, had embraced the heresy of Gnosticism. Now, we're going to talk a lot about Gnosticism in a couple of weeks. It's a very, very complex uh, heresy. We'll just leave it at that for now. Um, it's basically centered around this whole concept of secret knowledge. Uh, the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis, which is where we get the word Gnostic from. And um, it was essentially that, um, yeah, there's, there's a biblical truth, but Jesus also gave a secret truth to just certain disciples, and not everybody is able to, um, to, to apprehend that knowledge, and so you have to be part of this secret society of sorts in order to gain this special knowledge, and it, and it really distorts the idea of creation that we see in Genesis, distorts the idea of Jesus being the Messiah, distorts all kinds of things. It's just, it's... Um, I said this last week, I'll say it again because it's probably the best way to explain it. It is probably the greatest work of science fiction that mankind has ever made, okay? And it's very, very complex and, and we could spend a long time uh, talking about it, but we'll probably spend one class for sure talking about it. And so, so he gets to Rome and he finds out, okay, well, the, the bishop of the church has fallen into heresy and my best friend who also served under Polycarp has fallen under heresy. And no doubt these two things were very influential in his later work in confronting heretics and heresy. Okay? In the year 177 AD, so you know, two, three years later, during his absence, so he's in Rome still, a severe localized persecution broke out in Lyon and Vienne under Emperor Marcus Aurelius. So the context here is that Christianity is a religio illicita, meaning that it is an illegal religion, but yet it is tolerated for the most part. But once in a while, we have these sporadic localized um, persecutions that rise up, and we saw that with Ignatius, we saw that with Polycarp, and uh, we see it here in Lyon and Vienne. Now, how did this get started, right? This is, this is probably one of the more famous um, instances and accounts of persecution that we have during this time um, because we have some documents that, that tell us about it. And so here's kind of what probably happened. The, the, pagan, the pagan way to determine whether the gods, the Roman gods, were happy with us, with the culture not me because I'm not in that, but you know what I'm saying, um, is to slaughter an animal, dissect its liver, and look for a certain mark on the liver. And if that mark is found, well, then that means that the gods are pleased with us and we can expect future blessing. But if the mark is absent, then the gods must be displeased with us and we can no doubt expect some kind of natural disaster to come, right? A volcano is going to erupt, there's going to be an earthquake, there's going to be a storm that wipes out our wheat crop. And so this was a common practice that, um, you know, it was a community event, slaughter the animal, dissect the liver out of the animal, and look for this mark to determine whether the gods, the Roman gods, were happy or not. Well, here's what happened in Lyon and Vienne. They dissected the animal took out its liver, 
There was no mark. The gods are upset. And so they start asking themselves, well, what's, what's different, right? Because last time we dissected the animal, um, the gods were happy with us. There was a mark, and now there isn't. So what happened? What did we do? What changed? And somebody steps up and says, well, you know what? I saw this group of Christians back in the corner while we were dissecting this animal, and they were making the sign of the cross. So, side note, right? The sign of the cross that the Catholics make, that predates Roman Catholicism. That was something that was normal in the early church. We make fun of it because, well, it's usually associated with Roman Catholicism, right? But, but that was a normal thing that the church did back in that day. But anyway, so in this situation, somebody says, well, I saw this, these Christians and they were, they were worshiping their God while we were trying to get an answer from our gods. And so therefore, it must mean that our gods are mad at us because we're tolerating the Christians. And so as a result, this very severe persecution breaks out in Lyon and Vienne and this region of Gaul. So interesting um, how these things happen, but as I mentioned, this was, this was okay because Christianity was an illegal religion until, you know, and it was kind of, it was really kind of overlooked probably for the most part until something like this happened, right? A natural disaster that pointed to the displeasure of the gods and so we need to answer to that and you know the scapegoat are the christians so let's kill the christians so that the gods can be happy with us again it's basically and so this is what we see here in the year 177 a.d a very severe localized persecution broke out so irenaeus returning to Lyon, he discovers that his bishop, Bishop Pothinus, has been martyred, and he is now appointed the new bishop, right? So in the persecution, um, one of the Christians who are martyred is the bishop, the pastor, and uh, Irenaeus arrives in Lyon, and uh, they tell him the bad news of, you know, the, the death of his pastor, and then they say, oh, and by the way, you're our new pastor, and uh, I'm not sure how that would make me feel knowing that there is severe persecution that's just always kind of threatening, you know, and who are they going to come after first, right? They're going to come after the leader of the Christians. And so, so anyway, he is appointed the new bishop. Then during the years of 189 to 198 AD, Irenaeus lives up to his name. Uh, Irenaeus in Greek means peacemaker. And he lives up to his name in the Paschal Controversy, I talked quite a bit about this last week. The Paschal Controversy was just simply the date, uh, debate over the date of when is Easter. What day was Jesus crucified on? Uh, the Roman church said it's on this date and we follow this way of determining it. And really the rest of the church said, well, no, it's this way. And uh, we know that because this is what the apostles have taught us. And, uh, and so there was this debate, it kind of went back and forth during Polycarp's time. It was kind of a secondary issue where, you know what, we'll just agree to disagree and it's not that big of a deal. But then a couple of generations later, um, a new bishop of Rome comes around and he's, he's not willing to compromise and he makes a big deal of it. And so in the middle of all of this, Irenaeus wades into it and he brings peace. And so this is uh, an important mark of his life. One of the big things that he did for the church. Shortly after this victory, another persecution breaks out under Emperor Severus in which probably, possibly thousands of Christians in Irenaeus' community are martyred. So this was a more widespread persecution and again, very, very severe. Irenaeus died somewhere around 202 AD, though probably not as a martyr. He probably lived out his life to the end of his days, uh, pastoring the church and all of its trials and troubles and tribulations, uh, but he himself probably was not martyred. At least that's where current scholarship is at. So any thoughts about his biography so far? Any questions? Anything? Okay, so if we just kind of take Irenaeus' life and just as a, as a whole, generally speaking, 
what were some of his contributions? We'll just, we looked at this last week, but just I think it's probably important to look at these again, so just briefly. Uh, first of all, Irenaeus is considered the most important theologian of the second century, period. So he is a contemporary of Tertullian, which we're going to study next, but Irenaeus is considered the most important theologian, even more so than Tertullian. And we're going to see a mark of that and a reason why that is this evening as we study out the rule of faith. Also, as we consider his importance, his significance, uh, his theological perspectives and teaching, uh, we understand that Irenaeus represents a movement from an apologetic focus, which was outside the church, right, from the inside out, like Justin Martyr, to a theological focus within the church. And as a result, the church is strengthened because of his ministry and is still being strengthened today because of his ministry. It's really pretty incredible. And I think we'll see that this evening, too, as we get into our lesson further. Secondly, he is an important theological uh, figure because he brought biblical clarity where there was speculative confusion through the witness of the apostles, right? So here we have the bishop in the church of Rome who has adopted Montanism and uh, doesn't believe that he needs the word of God because he has the Holy Spirit and that's enough. And uh, there's all this speculation, there's all this confusion that comes out of it. And so Irenaeus wades in once again with the foundation of the apostolic teaching handed down from John to Polycarp to Irenaeus and he clarifies things. And this is what his ministry does, and that's what his ministry still does for us today. He's not teaching anything new that Scripture doesn't teach, but he is drawing it out into light so that we can see it clearly. So he is bringing biblical clarity where there was often speculation and confusion. Thirdly, he provides an effective model for approaching heresy used by later Christians. And this is just... Um, I have such high respect for Irenaeus because of his approach against heresies, against heretics and heresies, right? Um, Martin Luther is very important to me, and when he goes against the Roman Catholics, he goes against the Anabaptists, um, sometimes in my flesh I find it kind of comical because he's, he's pretty rough with them and he's pretty shrewd and pretty sly and uh, he says some things that just make me smile. I probably shouldn't, but you know what I mean? And he's just, he's kind of, he's just kind of on the attack, right? Irenaeus takes a different approach. First of all, he outlines what the Gnostics believe and he goes into great depth of detail. They believe this, they believe that, A, B, C, and D. And then he goes on to say, this is why A is wrong, this is why B is wrong, this is why C is wrong, this is why D is wrong. But he gives them a, an opportunity of sorts to let their teachings stand, and then he just wipes it out. And I think that's just, a, it's a very godly way of approaching things, right? Um, a lot of times we like to attack the idea and attack the person before we completely understand them. It doesn't mean that they're right if we don't understand them. It just means that we need to give them consideration so that our response will be that much more strongly effective. Does that make sense? We're going to see that especially when we talk um, in his book against heresies, against, uh, against the Gnostics, and because he, he just does a, a superb uh, godly, noble um, way of doing this, where he, he just approaches it um, with the way I think Jesus would. You know, uh, well, you believe this, and this is why it's wrong, right? Instead of just saying you're wrong. Does that make sense? Anyway, we'll talk more about that later, probably. Fourthly, Irenaeus is an important theological figure because uh, he has the perspective that all of redemptive history concludes with Jesus Christ. Right? All of the Old Testament is pointing forward to Christ. All of the New Testament is pointing back to Christ. Jesus is the central figure of redemptive history. 
He is the reason for everything. Everything culminates in Christ, and Irenaeus just brings that out time and time and time again, and uh, just absolutely love that. Fifthly, I suppose we could say this, is that he presents a theology which is very approachable. Irenaeus is easy to read. Um, his stuff is just straightforward. Um, if, if you have any kind of uh, biblical reading under your belt, Irenaeus is going to make easy sense for you. Um, so we use the big word of theologian, and oftentimes that scares us, maybe intimidates us. But Irenaeus was a theologian of top rank, and he is very approachable. He's very easy. Um, not so much as maybe with Augustine, although Augustine has his points where he's very approachable too, very easy to understand, but Augustine is, uh, is uh, a genius on a whole other level that sometimes we read his stuff and it's like, I have no clue what you're saying, <laughs> you know, so anyway, Irenaeus is easy to read, very approachable, okay, any thoughts about any of that? Okay, his written works include two First of which is called Detection and Overthrow of the Knowledge Falsely So-Called. I love that title. And uh, it is this book here. The shorter title is called Against Heresies. And this is mostly against Gnosticism. Uh, though he does talk in here um, against the Marcionites. We'll talk about who that is and what that is. As well as the Ebionites. Um, but this is five books in one. And the first chapter, the first book is all about, like I mentioned before in point number three, I think it was, of him just outlining what the belief system of the Gnostics is. And he does a very good job. He's very detailed. He's very fair. And then the next four books, he just takes his sword, the sword of the Spirit, and just knocks it, knocks it down. So, so that is one book of his that has survived to modern times. The second one is called The Demonstration of the Apostolic Preaching, or the shorter title is On the Apostolic Preaching. It's a much shorter book. Uh, this is a very important book. Um, part of this will be your homework for next week. And uh, so I'm a year into my master's studies at Knox Theological Seminary, and this book has been required reading three times in three different classes. This is a very important book. Uh, apart from Scripture, that's the only book that has found its way repeatedly into my courses. So uh, this is a very important document that we have. And then also we have six lost works of Irenaeus that we know of. Uh, we have fragments of papyrus, you know, that, that you know, are, are attributed to him. Uh, we also have other church fathers, early church fathers, that quoted uh, some of these six lost works. And so... Um, we know they're, they, they, he wrote them, but uh, you know they've been lost in the sands of time, so to speak. So that's what we have on Irenaeus to today. And uh, any thoughts about his biography or introduction before we move into this evening's lesson on the rule of faith? Yeah, Lodine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Yep. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yep. And I think specifically we see that presented in two forms. One that we've already studied extensively is that of martyrdom. And now we're kind of drawing out another way that the world, the devil, has tried to destroy Christianity is through false teaching. And so, you know, that's kind of the direction we're going now with Irenaeus. But that's very observant um, that uh, where there's the truth, there is opposition. 
And I don't know if that encourages me or discourages me, knowing that for 2,000 years the church has been wrestling with this um, and has been fighting this battle. I, on the one hand, it encourages me because, hey, we're still here. On the other hand, that doesn't make me feel too good because the battle is fierce sometimes, right? So that's uh, very good, very good. Anybody else? Yeah, Joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to see um, more of what you're talking about, and, and hopefully I am able to stress it properly, this whole concept of apostolic succession, right? Where did we get our knowledge of Jesus Christ from? From the apostles, and they wrote it down in this book. And they passed it along to the church. And the church has faithfully passed it down generation upon generation for the last 2,000 years. And so we're standing on the shoulders of those who went before us. And the teaching that we hold to is the same teaching that was given to the apostles through Christ. And uh, hopefully that will be conveyed through that, because through this lesson of Irenaeus. Because um, that is so important that we understand that. We didn't, we're not pulling this out of the air somewhere that Jesus Christ is the son of God born of a virgin and lived a sinless life and died under Pontius Pilate and was put into a grave and then three days later rose from the, rose from the dead. Uh, we're not pulling that out of the air. That is apostolic teaching. The apostles taught that to the church and the church has faithfully generation after generation passed that on. And we have that same responsibility to the next generation, right? So hopefully I'm able to convey that. Hopefully you'll see that in Irenaeus. So let's keep moving here. Those are great observations, but for sake of time, let's keep moving here. Um, I want to make just five general observations as we move to the rule of faith. So this was a document I gave you last week. Um, the rule of faith comes from the first chapter of this book, Against Heresies. And then on the back side of that document, there is uh, something titled like Keeping to the Rule of Faith, and that comes from this book, okay? So what you have there are just snippets of both accounts that um, Irenaeus and many early church fathers referred to as the rule of faith, right? What is faith in Jesus Christ? If we're going to make a summary of it, well, it's this, and we're going to call it the rule of faith. So Irenaeus talks a lot about this rule of faith. That's what he's referring to. We also find other early church fathers use that same terminology. And so as we consider the rule of faith, which you have in your hands, hopefully, if you don't, raise your hand and Alex will get you one. Um, but there's five general observations that we want to make about this. And uh, first of all is that Irenaeus' theological account of faith and truth was groundbreaking in his time. Now, that doesn't mean that what he is saying about faith is something new. What, what he is saying is what he sees in Scripture. But what was groundbreaking about it is that in Irenaeus' uh, presentation of it, it is a very full expression of it, and it was really probably the first time the church really wrote it down other than what was written in Scripture. Right? So, on the apostolic preaching is a fuller testimony of the rule of faith, and it is the earliest, fullest summary of the Christian faith outside of Scripture that we possess today. And that's huge. I mean, this is, uh, it's essentially a commentary on Scripture and on faith. But it is the first time, as far as we know today, that this was done and given to the church. Here's a summary of what faith in Christ is and why it is. So that's... That's big. This was probably groundbreaking. He isn't saying anything new that wasn't already said in Scripture, but as far as the presentation of it, it was new. Yeah, Jay. Absolutely. Yeah, don't listen to the, um, oh, what's that movie? The Da Vinci Code. 
Don't listen to the Da Vinci Code that says, oh, we didn't have the Bible until 325 A.D. when Constantine became emperor and then he established the books of the Bible. That's a complete lie. We're talking about Irenaeus in probably, you know, he probably wrote these uh, uh, 160, 170 A.D. So we're talking uh, 160, 170, 180 years before Constantine and it is chock full of references of Scripture. The Bible was in its inception from the very beginning. That's, that's one of those myths, if you go back in your, uh, in your, in your uh, binder there, that's one of those myths that we talked about, that the Bible didn't have, or that the church didn't have the Bible until three or four hundred years into its existence. That's, that's false. And we'll see that here in a minute with, uh, with Irenaeus, I think. More so next week as you read that Uh, Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So this probably answers your question even further, Jay, is that Irenaeus, as we read his writings against heresies and also against, or against, or also on the apostolic preaching, we find that Irenaeus accepts and easily assumes the canon or the rule of Scripture as the foundation for everything theological. And so what I mean by that is, In part one of On the Apostolic Preaching, there are almost 200 scripture quotes in 17 pages of writing. So let me put that into perspective. My sermons on Sunday morning are about 17 pages of notes, and my scripture quotes are usually between 20 and 30. Irenaeus has 200, Old Testament and New Testament. So he accepts and easily assumes the canon of Scripture, and he uses it as the foundation for everything. Again, another reason why we should have a very high regard for him as a theologian. Thirdly, talking about the rule of faith, Irenaeus recognizes the continuity between the Old Testament and the apostolic teaching, which is the New Testament. Um, So there was a... um, Another heresy, we'll, we'll probably talk about it, um, Martianism, that really wanted to get rid of the Old Testament, right? They, they saw the Old Testament and the New Testament as having two gods, right? There's the God of the Old Testament who's this angry, judgmental, wrathful, wants to, you know, cause genocide of all these pagan societies. And then there's the New Testament God who's just full of grace and love and joy and peace, and his name's Jesus, and we really like him, and and so Martianism wanted to get rid of the Old Testament. And, uh, but here we find Irenaeus, and that was a, it was a big movement, right? It was a big issue in the early church. Um, but here's Irenaeus who comes along, and, and he strongly stands firm and says, no, there is continuity between the Old Testament and what the apostles taught us in the New Testament. And in fact, it all harmonizes and culminates in Christ. The Old Testament pointed forward to Christ, the New Testament points back to Christ. And so there's great continuity that Irenaeus stood for. And, uh, and we would say the same thing today, right? I mean, are we okay with that? That uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, harmonize, there's, there's a continuity, so good, right on. Because believe it or not, this is still around today. Um, you know, there is, uh, there's some very high profile pastors in America that are trying to get rid of the Old Testament. And maybe they won't go so far as to say that there's two gods, but they will say that God is not like the God of the Old Testament any longer. Right? You don't need to fear him. You don't need to keep his commandments. Right? That God is, you know, that was a different dispensation of time. And anyway, I could say a lot about that, but but this, that Irenaeus is, uh, points us the way forward. Okay? Let's leave it at that. Along with that, Irenaeus publicly acknowledges the authority of the apostolic witness, the New Testament, as equal to the authority of the Old Testament prophets, right? So here's, here's, the, uh, here's the distinction, right? So the inspiration of Scripture, Old Testament came through the prophets, New Testament came through the apostles, right? And so Irenaeus recognizes that both have equal authority. The Old Testament prophets that wrote the scriptures, the New Testament apostles that wrote the scriptures, they have equal authority. 
And again, this is something that is challenged today. Right? So, uh, anyway, I, I'm going to get way off track if I keep going down these rabbit trails. But Irenaeus stands firm and points the way forward in acknowledging publicly, unashamedly, that yes, the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles are equal in authority according to the authority that God has given them. So, you know, so therefore we don't look at, <laughs> here I go down the rabbit trail. We don't look at the writings of Moses as being more important than the writings of Peter. There's teaching like that around that says, well, Moses is first, and then, you know, then maybe we would move into um, Isaiah and Jeremiah that have a greater authority than, or not as much authority as Moses, but more authority than maybe the minor prophets, and, and, then, uh, and then maybe we would bring in some of the New Testament stuff, you know, maybe Paul would put in there, maybe Matthew, and they see this um, succession of authority, right? And oftentimes it begins with Moses, Right, and it's often influenced by Judaism or false Judaism, and uh, but what Irenaeus shows us from Scripture is that the Old Testament, the New Testament, are on equal footing. Okay. Fifthly, generally speaking, about the rule of faith, Irenaeus is motivated to articulate the rule of faith because of heretical views which threaten orthodoxy, which is right doctrine, and orthopraxy, which is right practice, right? So why did he, I mean, imagine, imagine, right, this is before the time of typewriters and computers. This is, uh, it's like 800 pages. Imagine handwriting a document like this and how long that would take. I don't know how long it took him to write it, but uh, that would be, that'd be rough, Right? And so why do something like that, that would take so much time, so much effort, so much energy? Well, it's because of the threat of heresy in the church. Gnostics claim to be Christian. The Montanists claim to be Christian. And so in order to sift out all the speculation and confusion, he writes this. So... The threat that he saw was a threat to orthodoxy. And remember, you might go back to uh, those nine myths that we talked about in the very early stages of his study. And one of those was um, 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 orthodoxy is a bad word, right? Is that a myth or is that true? And we claim that it's a myth. Orthodoxy is not a bad word. It is a good word. Orthodox just simply means right doctrine, right truth right theology we could even say and we understand that when there is right doctrine it will lead into right practice so orthodoxy leads into orthopraxy and so Irenaeus saw that as being threatened and so he sat down to write an 800 800 page book by hand (laughs) amongst other things okay So generally speaking, that's what we're looking at when we're entering into this document called the Rule of Faith. Are there any questions? Okay, let's keep moving then. And we're just going to read it this evening and then make some observations like we've done in the past with different things. And uh, I've I've split this into two sections. So if you have your document before you, uh, under the Rule of Faith, there's two paragraphs uh, and I've split those into section one and section two. First paragraph is section one, second paragraph is section two, and so let's just read it. The church, though dispersed throughout the whole world, even to the ends of the earth, has received from the apostles and their disciples this faith. She, the church, believes in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are in them, And in one Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who became incarnate for our salvation. And in the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed through the prophets the dispensations or the times or seasons of God. And the advents or the comings, right? Which would be a, uh, um, you know, a nod to the advents of Christ. And the birth from a virgin, and the passion, and the resurrection from the dead, and the ascension into heaven in the flesh of the beloved Christ Jesus our Lord, 
and his future manifestation from heaven in the glory of the Father to gather all things in one, so a scripture quote there, and to raise up anew all flesh of the whole human race in order that to Christ Jesus, our Lord and God and Savior and King, according to the will of the invisible Father, again another scripture quote, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess to him and that he should execute just judgment towards all. That he may send spiritual wickednesses and the angels who transgressed and became apostates, backsliders, together with the ungodly and unrighteous and wicked and profane among men into everlasting fire, but may, in the exercise of his grace, confer immortality on the righteous and holy and those who have kept his commandments and have persevered in his love, some from the beginning of their Christian course and others from the date of their repentance and may surround them with everlasting glory. And so we'll pause there. And, and uh, this is Irenaeus' summary of what faith is. This is the substance of faith. Okay, It's his rule of faith. So let's make some observations. First of all, the rule of faith received by the church universal, or we could say the church Catholic, is received from the apostles. And just by way of reminder, that word Catholic does not belong to the Roman Catholic Church. Catholic just simply means universal. And so, as we read this, we see that the rule of faith is received, as received by the church, universal is received from who? From the apostles. Right? He makes this very, very clear. Where did, where did our faith, uh, the teaching of faith in Christ come from? Jesus taught it to the apostles, the apostles taught it to the next generation, the next generation taught it to the next generation, and the church has handed it down, so on and so forth. But originally it came from the apostles, which came directly from the teaching of Christ. The other thing we observe is that the rule of faith received by the church universal believes in one God represented in three persons. Right. So this is another one of those myths and for some reason, Constantine always gets the credit, you know, that uh, while there was no such thing as the Trinity in the church, the church didn't believe in the Trinity until, you know, Constantine came along and, and, uh, and made it so, you know. Because up until that point, nobody believed Jesus was God. They just believed he was a man. But then Constantine wanted to unite the empire. And so, hey, let's just make Jesus part of the Godhead. And, you know, we'll just throw the Holy Spirit in there, too. And all of a sudden, we've got this Trinity and... You know, that's, that's the myth that's out there. But here we find Irenaeus writing in 160, 170 AD, 200 years before Constantine, and he is representing a Trinitarian formula of one God in three persons. That's huge. That's huge. So what does he say about this one God in three persons? He says, well, we have God the Father who created all things, We have God the Son, who became flesh or was incarnate for the purpose of salvation. And we have God the Holy Spirit, who proclaimed all, all times, or the word he uses is dispensations, and advents through the prophets. And so in this is kind of an interesting formula because this is probably how a lot of times when we think about Trinitarian issues that we think about it, right? We think about God the Father as the one who created the heavens and the earth, right? Fathers create. Uh, and then we see the Son as the one who came with mercy and salvation. And then we see the Holy Spirit who, who has empowered his word and comes alongside us as, as our helper in order to bring to remembrance everything that God has taught us and and, uh, and a lot of times, I think, even in the church today, we see it this way. And so it's interesting, as we look at Irenaeus, that this is how he presents the, uh, the Godhead. God the Father creates, God the Son saves, and God the Holy Spirit speaks. If you, if you dig into that further, you realize that there's incredible overlap, right? God the Father wasn't alone when he created, right? Look at Genesis, the first chapter. The Spirit was hovering over the waters. God spoke the word of God, who is who? Jesus. 
And so we find that, you know, all three representations of the Godhead are there in creation. And so there's overlap, but, but generally speaking, I think this is probably how we look at the Trinity and their, and their ministry, we could call it. So interesting, interesting. I'm not sure what to, you know, how important that is, but. Irenaeus also, as we've seen so far in his rule of faith, includes he talks about his about the dispensations of God and the advents of God and advents we're talking about the coming of Christ and so we understand there are two advents the first advent was when he came as a baby in a manger and then of course the second advent is his second coming Uh, and so Irenaeus points this out right this is not a new teaching that the church has somehow discovered but we go back uh thousands of years here and we find Irenaeus is teaching us about the advents of Christ and so what does he say in the first advent he mentions Christ's birth Jesus was born also he points to Christ's passion passion just does not mean emotional fervor passion here means suffering going back to the Latin definition of the word So the passion of the Christ, the movie, right? It's not that Jesus was passionate, but it's that Christ was suffering, right? So Passion Week, we sometimes call that week before Easter. It's uh, about Christ's suffering, not his emotional fervor, okay? Thirdly, Irenaeus includes in the first advent Christ's resurrection. So he was born, he suffered and died, and he was also resurrected, And not only that, but Christ's ascension. Forty days later, Christ ascended to the right hand of God, where he sits and makes intercession for his church. So it's interesting, as we consider the rule of faith, as we consider the uh, fundamental elements of faith, Irenaeus says, well, this is what we see in Scripture. And this is foundational for Christian faith, a faith which saves But he doesn't just stop there. He goes on to talk about the second advent of Christ. And this includes the glory of God that when Christ returns from heaven, he will be returning in God's glory. Along with that, it will include the resurrection of the whole human race. And I think this is a very important point. Oftentimes as Christians, we talk about the resurrection But uh, scripture would teach, as well as what Irenaeus is bringing to the forefront, is that all of human creation is going to be resurrected. It's not just the Christians. Everybody will be raised with a physical body, though some will be turned away to judgment and others to glory. I think that's important. We we often skip over that, right? Because we're more concerned about ourselves, probably, and we want to talk about our resurrection and the glory, you know. But but all of mankind will be resurrected. Everybody who has ever lived. Also, in that is the confession of all creatures. So we read the quote from Philippians there that every creature in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will bow their knee and will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And uh, so we see here the confession of all creatures, not just mankind, but the animals. They will somehow give glory to God in that moment when Christ sets foot on the earth. Interesting. And we would agree with that, right? As Irenaeus isn't, so far, as far as I'm concerned, Irenaeus isn't saying anything that we shouldn't already know, that we don't already agree with. And he also points out that in the second advent of Christ, there will be the judgment of all people. This is his language. The judgment of all people. He uses that word judgment. Now, Christ would designate that we specifically have escaped judgment. If we're in Christ, if our faith is sure and true, we have escaped judgment. But in a sense, um, there is still a judgment of sorts that happens. Right? That, um, that on that day, there is a separation Right, we read this in Matthew 25, the goats and the sheep. Right, so there's still this sense of, yeah, we've escaped wrath. I guess judgment in wrath, that that aspect of judgment, Um, but yet there's still a judgment that is made whereby we are uh, set apart. Where we're, um, well, here's what he says. 
first of all, there's a judgment of justice, whereby wicked apostates, right, those who have backslide, those who have turned away from God and from the knowledge of God, Romans 1 would be a good example, wicked apostates, including fallen angels, which we call demons, will be punished in everlasting fire. So, so he talks about the judgment of all flesh, and that falls into two categories, the first of which is a judgment of justice, right? Um, those who have sinned against a holy God will receive justice, and that justice is eternal fire. But then there's also another judgment, which is the judgment of grace, in which righteous disciples who persevere in their Christian course will receive everlasting glory. And so he talks about this in the same sense of, of judgment, of, you know, maybe that's, you know, there, maybe there's a better word to use than that because we have a preconceived idea of what judgment is. It's usually a very negative. But as I mentioned, read Matthew 25 tonight and you'll, you'll understand this, that there's a separation. And that separation um, uh, culminates in two categories of people, right? Um, those who will receive God's justice, which is his wrath against sin, and those who will receive grace. And that grace is given to those who persevere. Okay. Any thoughts about that? Does that sound right? Is Irenaeus on the right path? If we take what he has said in his rule of faith, and we, we open up our Bibles and say, okay, Irenaeus, you know, let's see, is it in here? Is it in here? I mean, this is pretty important. He's teaching us about what saving faith is, what the, what the core elements of what we need to believe in order to be saved. He's teaching us what those are. So has he said anything false? Let's start there. Would anybody challenge anything? I mean, we're all friends here. I mean, you know, um, seriously, do you, do you think there's anything that you would disagree with that, that Irenaeus has said here? No, I don't think so either. This is fundamental orthodoxy right here at its finest. So what do you think about that as far as its necessity for faith? Do you think everything that he has said, which we all agree is correct, do we think that all of those elements are necessary for faith, for saving faith in Christ? Or can we leave out that mm, God the Father created all things? Can we leave that out and still have saving faith? Yeah, they are, aren't they? Okay, let's, I think we have enough time to get through the second section here, so let's move on into the next part, section two. And he picks it up and says this, as I have, al as I have already observed, the church, having received this preaching and this faith, which he just outlined for us, although scattered throughout the whole world, yet as if occupying but one house, carefully preserves it. She also believes these points of doctrine just as if she had but one soul and one and the same heart, and she proclaims them and teaches them and hands them down with perfect harmony as if she possessed only one mouth. So he's using the word she here in reference to the church, right? Personification there. For although the languages of the world are dissimilar, un unalike, yet the import of the tradition is one and the same, the tradition of faith. For the churches which have been planted in Germany do not believe or hand down anything different, nor do those in Spain, nor those in Gaul, France, nor those in the East, nor those in Egypt, nor those in Libya, nor those which have been established in the central regions of the world. But as the Son, that creature or creation of God, is one and the same throughout the whole world, so also the preaching of the truth shines everywhere and enlightens all men that are willing to come to a knowledge of the truth. 
great image there. Nor will any one of the rulers in the churches, however highly gifted he may be in point of eloquence, teach doctrines different from these. For no one is greater than the master, Christ. Nor, on the other hand, will he who is deficient in power of expression inflict injury on the tradition. For the faith being ever one and the same, neither does one who is able at great length to discourse regarding it make any addition to it, nor does one who can say but little about it diminish it. And I love that. So let's, let's unpackage this. Right? This, is, this is just great. Observations. So he points out that though the church is scattered across the world, yet as one house, it's the imagery he uses, as one house, several important things. I think it's four or five. She, first of all, preserves one true faith. The true church of Christ, who has been handed down the teaching of the apostles and the faith therein, preserves one true faith. Now, this is probably something that all of these probably are going to challenge us a bit in our modern culture because we see hundreds, if not thousands, of denominations that all call themselves the church but don't teach the same thing. But as far as Irenaeus is concerned, there is one church, though it's scattered abroad, and it preserves one faith. There's no such thing, it's an oxymoron to say that there are many churches with many faiths. That's not biblical, nor is it what Irenaeus is teaching. There's one true church and one true faith. Right, part of this is in response to the Gnostics who are saying, yeah, we're Christians. Um, we believe that, uh, you know, that Jesus, um, you know, it, it, so goofy. Jesus came from this, this mass of sinful matter that another God emitted because of their fallenness. And we'll get into it. I'm telling you, it's science fiction, dude. And, and so, therefore, their, their understanding is that Jesus was created and he is the byproduct of sin. But yeah, we're still Christians like you guys are. And so Irenaeus steps in and says, no, there's one faith, and the one true church preserves it perfectly. And not only that, it has come down to us from the apostles. This is how we know. Jesus taught them. They taught us. It's preserved in this book. Okay? Let's let's keep going. You're going to love the Gnostics. I mean, it's just, it's great stuff. Though the church is scattered as one house, yet she believes one true faith, right? You, you hear this once in a while amongst Christians, right? Well, they believe in, they, they have this belief in their denomination, and they have that belief in their denomination, and I was uh, at a store in Ames Monday, and the checkout lady, um, we just got to talking, and, and I said, yeah, I'm a pastor, and she says, oh, oh, what? What faith? What do you believe? Do you believe in Mary? I'm like, well, I believe in Jesus. Does that qualify? You know? But it's this whole idea that, well, this denomination believes this or emphasizes this, and this denomination emphasizes this in their faith. And, but Irenaeus is saying, no, there, there is one true faith, and he's just outlined the tenets of it for us, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, Advents, first advent, second advent, this is what's going to happen in each one, this is what has happened, and, uh, and these are the essential elements. Yes, yeah, right, right, this is why we're studying the early church fathers, <laughs> it brings a lot of this back into, back into right perspective. Okay, so let's keep going, thirdly, though the church is scattered abroad, as one house, she proclaims one true faith, right? Well, I visited that church, and the pastor was preaching about this, which, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be in the Bible, but hey, that's what they proclaim. But yet, they're, you know, they're, yeah, they, it says church above the door, it says Christian above the door. Irenaeus says, no, they proclaim the true, the true church proclaims one true faith, period. 
And not only that, but teaches one true faith. And fifthly, hands down one true faith. Right? We have a responsibility to the current generation to proclaim and teach this one true apostolic faith, but we also have a responsibility to hand it down to the next generation. And we're not passing down five different forms of faith. Irenaeus says there's one true faith that we're passing down. At least one true faith that will save, right? It's funny, sometimes like Sunday morning when I preached about false religions and I talked about elements of the golden rule being found in Buddhism and Taoism and Confucianism and whatever else. And, and it's always, it always seems to me like there's a little bit of uncomfortableness in the room when you start saying that other religions are false. Because we have been trained, probably because we have British background, no, no offense, Linda, but that we just we want to be nice to the false religions. Well, maybe we need to be accurate to the false religions. And we need to explain that there is one true faith. And we need to be firm and not apologize for it. That's what Irenaeus is doing. So, according to Irenaeus, the rule of faith received and proclaimed by the church is singular. Right? There's one true faith. It is universal across all the churches that are true churches. And it is unchanging. Right? Just as Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, so the saving faith that he has given to the church is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? Jesus isn't coming up with new plans of salvation all the time, that, you know, that, that salvation is changing. It's singular, it's universal, faith is unchanging. Now, it might grow, it might mature, it might develop, and, and hopefully that is true in all of us. But essentially, at its core, it is unchanging, the tenets of it. Therefore, Irenaeus points out that the rule of faith is not threatened by diverse locations. The church is scattered worldwide, Irenaeus says, which at this point in time, it really wasn't. I mean, it was, it was Europe and the East and maybe portions of Africa, um, you know, really hadn't spread as far as it has today, but that's, his, that's how he describes it. The church has been scattered abroad. But even though it's been scattered abroad, the rule of faith is not threatened by that. Though there's diverse locations of the church around the world, the rule of faith remains the same. Not only that, but the rule of faith is not threatened by diverse languages. Right? He points out that the rule of faith in Germany and the rule of faith in Spain, that though they teach different languages, is still the same. Their languages are distinct and different, radically so in some ways, but the rule of faith is the same. And that's just a great wonder. You know, I don't know if you've ever been on a mission trip before, but I remember going to Guatemala and uh, going to a couple of church services that were in these little tin shacks, you know, and it was just... I, I don't speak Spanish, I don't understand Spanish, but man, you could, you could sense their passion and their love for their Savior, you know, and it was just, it was overwhelming, that experience, you know, that it's, they're worshiping the same God, they're worshiping the same God who is revealed in the same Bible that I have, it's a different language, but, and all of that is founded on the same faith that I have, incredible. Thirdly, and we'll end here this evening, the rule of faith is not threatened by diverse gifting, and I think this is important too. Here's what Irenaeus says at the very end of, uh, of this portion of discourse, and he says, uh, let's see, nor will any one of the rulers or you know, the, uh, the elders in the churches, however highly gifted he may, he may be in point of eloquence, right, so you have a very gifted speaker, right? They're very eloquent and they're very, they're very highly gifted. But he says, no, no one of these rulers who are highly gifted will teach doctrines different from anybody else. Or on the other hand, will he who is deficient in power of expression, right? They're just, 
you know, they're not as eloquent. They don't, they don't speak as, as clearly or as powerfully as maybe somebody else who has a higher gifting. But in the same way, he says, look, even in their deficiency, they cannot uh, inflict injury on faith. Faith remains the same whether one is able to articulate it really well or really poorly. Right? Which points to the great truth that faith is not dependent upon man. Right? Faith is dependent on Christ and what he has revealed in his scripture through the apostles. You know, and we see this, right? John the Beloved was a fisherman, probably not very highly educated. And when you read his writings in Greek, they are very, very simple. Very short sentences. Very easy words as far as Greek is concerned. On the other end of the spectrum, you read Luke, who was a physician, who was highly educated, and his Greek is very advanced. It's very difficult to read. At least, well, that's my perspective. For some, it's probably not. But. And so what Irenaeus is saying, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have any bearing on faith. Because faith is not dependent upon how well we're able to articulate it. I, I like that. It, it uh, takes a lot of burden <laughs> off. So we, we got to leave it at, at there. There's more to say, but we'll, we need to leave it there this evening. And uh, we'll pick back up on it next Wednesday. Any thoughts? Bill. What do you mean? Oh. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, yeah. So scripture says that, um, oh, where is it? It must have been Paul to one of the churches where he talks about, you know, there's, there's been rumors of false teaching among you and to the Corinthians, I think. And he says, you know, uh, for the most part, I believe it just because of the nature of your contentious, rebellious soul, right? But then Paul takes it a step further and he says, and God has allowed it to prove you. And so it's the same thing that Jesus taught in his parable, um, you know, where the farmer sowed seed and then he went to bed and woke up in the morning. There's all kinds of tares in his field. And the servants come along and say, uh, Master, didn't you sow good seed in the field? How come we have all these tares growing here? And, uh, and, and the farmer's kind of confused about the whole thing. And, and so the servants say, well, do you want us to go out and pluck up all the tares? Right? Let's just get rid of them. Right? They're taking up resources from the wheat. And what does the master say? He says, no, let them grow up together. And in the day of judgment, the angels of God will come and separate the two. So part of this is God's own providential wisdom, and I don't have an answer for you. But part of it, I think what we see in Scripture is that God has allowed it to prove the true church. And praise God, he's given us Irenaeus to help lead us through the way. Not because Irenaeus is anything, but because Irenaeus points us back to Scripture. Okay, let me be clear. Let's pray. There's a lot I've given you tonight. So, Father, in all of this, God, we thank you so much for your apostolic witness that we have in the New Testament, your prophetic witness that we have in the Old Testament, both of which come together to culminate in your Son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for that. God, we also thank you that you have given to the church servants such as Irenaeus, who are great theologians, who are able to, um, by the gifting of the Holy Spirit, draw out these truths so that we can see them clearly. And so, Father, I pray that what we've seen this evening from Irenaeus is that um, our faith would be encouraged, that our strength would be solidified, that though we look around the world and we... we it seems as if we see such a diverse teaching within the church that just does not harmonize with each other. God, I thank you for the voice of Irenaeus that draws us back to center, explaining to us that there is one true faith, and it's in this faith we stand in Christ alone. 
And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We will uh, see you next Wednesday. Uh, my family and I are leaving tomorrow to go out of town for a couple of days, and we won't be back till Sunday night. So uh, pray for us. And, and uh, like I said, if you need anything, you can always contact the board members, and uh, we'll see you again next week. So God bless.